and we thank God for it. So this morning, um, I want to kind of continue on a thought uh, I talked about last week towards the end um, when we were taking uh, a couple verses out of the Lord's Prayer. And the last one that we talked about was Matthew 6.13, which said, Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so I wanted to look at that a little bit this morning, what it is to deliver us from evil. Uh, and let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful that we can be here uh, today as we are each week. Um, thankful that we are able to have the things we have uh, to look at uh, the scriptures and to uh, read them and study them and um, hopefully take what the simple things that you have for us are uh, and how we're supposed to live our lives each day. Uh, Lord, I hope, hope you open our eyes to these things as we read. Uh, let them grab our attention uh, throughout each day so that we can glorify your name and your name can be glorified in us uh, among the world. Amen. So we want to ask the question about evil. And he says, deliver me from evil, or in some translations, it will say, deliver me from the evil one. And that would be an evil one that could tempt me and draw me in, um, and in doing so, cause me to do evil things, or inflict evil on me, or is it deliver me from an evil mindset that I can serve uh, fully the way I should. So I explored different translations to see which ones had evil, like the NASB does, just by itself, um, or other ones that say the evil one, and they all differ. Uh, the Net Bible goes with the evil one, and they have a, a small note that goes along with why they choose evil one. Um, the Message Bible uh, is the only one that I found that covers all the options. Uh, he says, keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. So let me be safe from me, who I could be, and let me be safe from the devil, who could be tempting me to be me. So I wonder today, is it more helpful for us just to think about ourselves, right? What am I doing? Uh, when I think about other scriptures, like in Romans 12 or 13, you know, Paul's not praying that I am delivered from Satan. Paul is admonishing me as a believer to live in the way I should live. And he's putting that on me. He's not putting it on anyone else. You, whoever is reading it, have a certain obligation to live a certain way. And the only person in your life that can uh, make that happen, and we can ask God to direct us in this way, uh, and we can read the words that are written for us, and we could do all these things, but ultimately it lands right in here. Am I going to go this way or am I going to go that way? And it's us. So saving us from ourselves. Uh, we looked at a couple of weeks ago that we're locked up in the world uh, in a physical sense, and there's, you know, the nature um, that's within us, which we've talked about a long time ago, the sarks. And all these things make us prone to fall back uh, and do things that we shouldn't do and say things that we shouldn't say and live ways we should not live. And I think that what Jesus is saying is those ways are evil. So, you know, I, I've mentioned this many times. What is Jesus or Paul referring to when he says evil? And people don't like to see themselves as evil, right? If you were to talk to someone who uh, doesn't believe in salvation, uh, you know, they just think, well, someday I'm going to stand before God and I think I'm a good person, mm -hmm. right? They wouldn't say, 
well, I know I'm an evil person, or I know I can do evil things. I just think, you know, I'm a good person. I, I try my best, and I do good. And we don't want to think of all the things that we do as evil. So are we evil? Who was Jesus speaking to? He was speaking to his disciples and the crowds that were following him. And are these people evil? You know, we think, well, Satan was evil. As people, the first thing that pops in many people's mind of evil is Hitler. Hitler was evil. Some people today think that certain politicians are evil. Or maybe we think of as a nation of being evil, we think of China, evil, right? Iran, evil. South Korea, evil. But we don't want to think of our own nation as evil. We're not evil, we're good, right? Murderers are evil and so are thieves. And so we don't see ourselves in these ways or things that we're connected to. We want to think, well, we're good. Where I live is good. What I'm connected to is good, right? Because that's how we want to think of ourselves. If you look up uh, this word, evil, in, in the Greek, uh, the Greek Testament, and uh, it's a concise dictionary of the words in the Greek Testament and the Hebrew Bible. Um, it says that this word means hurtful. It can mean uh, a physical sense could be evil. Someone has a disease, we can call that disease evil. Um, but most often in the Bible, it refers to ethical and moral questions and how we live. And there's different words in here that it it describes, but uh, one thing it says is that it indicates a degeneracy from an original virtue. So if someone's really virtuous and they do something wrong and they choose to do something wrong and they find themselves in a situation where they feel the only thing they can do is wrong or what the Bible will call evil, then they've degenerated from what they were in that particular instance. So it uses words like calamitous. Diseased, culpable, derelict, vicious, vicinerous. I had to look that word up. Fasc I think I said it right because I looked up how to pronounce it. Vicinerous. It, to me, it looks like fascinorous, but it means extremely evil. Extremely evil. Mischief, malice. Uh, they have bad, evil, grievous, harm, lewd, malicious, wicked. All these different things. That word can be used with all those words in Scripture. So it doesn't always use evil. It uses different things. So I think for us, honestly, if we just own up to the fact that we can be evil. And there's many Scriptures that point to that, and I just want to look at a few. So in Luke 6, 45, we read... The good man, out of the treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil, treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. So, you read this verse, you almost get a sense that, well, good people speak good things, and evil people speak evil things, right? Uh, in the context, this is a, the Beatitudes when Luke gives the Beatitudes, or the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, it's a lot smaller than Matthew's. Um, and Jesus is talking about the good trees and their fruit and the bad trees and their fruit. He talks about the speck in your eye uh, that you think is a speck uh, in someone else's eye and in your eye is the big log. I mean, he goes through all those things. And then he says, if you're good, you speak good. If you're evil, you speak evil. And if I read that and I think about it, I think, do I ever speak evil? Of course I do. Everybody does. Does that mean I'm an evil person? I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's saying you can speak good things and you can speak evil things. If in your heart is something evil, evil is going to come out. If it's something good, good is going to come out. Uh, you know, and we all have our measuring charts, you know. One thing that's funny to me is TV, right? It used to be when you watch TV, there really wasn't swearing. There was light things, right? 
because it was public, it was out there. Now with streaming services, nothing is forbidden, right? right? And, you know, some people have a, a list in their mind of what words they'll take and what words they won't take, right? You can have debates with people on what is swearing and what's not. What's the Lord's taking the Lord's name in vain and what's not? Um, you know, you might know a believer who swears and says things that you're like, whoa, why are you saying that, right? Uh, and you can watch a show and you have, you know, maybe we'll start watching a show and they swear, you know, 15 times in the first five minutes. And you're like, nope, click off, right? You have a point where you say it's going to be too much. They're just going to do it too much. But then there's a show where they swear once and then 20 minutes later, they swear again. And then you're like, okay, I'll watch that, right? So you have these lists in your mind of what is wrong, what is speaking evil, and what isn't speaking evil. And that's just an example. Um, it could be anything. It could be the contents of the show. You know, you sometimes Lisa and I turn on a, a crime show, and it's, it's about a little kid or a child or something. And we're like, oh, I can't watch that, right? Because it's just in your mind. It's just like, Eesh. I can't watch that. Uh, so you have different levels in your mind of where you think you can go or what you can think you can take in that's evil or what you think that you can um, stand by and watch that is evil. Uh, it, goes, it goes many different ways for different people. Um, in Matthew 7, 11, which is from the Sermon on the Mount, it says, if then being evil... If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? And, you know, just a little thought here when you read this verse. Again, who is he talking to? Disciples, the crowds that are listening, whoever happens to be there. And he's talking about being evil. And even someone who's evil can do something good for somebody. And so he's making that comparison. Well, if God in heaven is the ultimate good. He always does good. So who is evil in this? Well, I think Jesus is saying, you all have the potential to be evil. And even though you're evil or you have that potential in you, you still can do good things. And so he's making that comparison. Um, in verse 12, it says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Many people will take out of that the golden rule, right? Treat others as you want them to treat you. So none of us hopefully believe that we deserve to have evil done to us, right? Unless maybe you've done something really wrong and someone is spewing out at you and you're like okay i deserve that right because of what i did but hopefully we look at that and we think okay so that's there i got that it's in me but i need to keep it at bay because i don't want to treat others that way jesus is saying you have that potential it's there um, in Matthew 22, 10, there's a story about uh, the wedding, right? The ruler, or the king, or this guy who wants to have a wedding, and he sends out invitations to all the good people, in quotation marks, the supposed good people, and nobody wants to come. And so he sends his servants out, and he tells them what? Get anybody. Because my wedding is going to have people in it. So go get them. And, of course, who do they get? It says, those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both good, both evil and good. Isn't it funny how my mind wanted to say good first? <laughs> both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Everybody was there. It didn't matter what they were like, evil or good. And it says, if you re keep reading it, he talks about a gown. What does he see? He sees a guy that's there 
that's not wearing a gown. And what, the, what happens? It's out you go. You can't be here. But when I stop and think about this, I think, all right. So they're going out, they're grabbing anybody they can. Off the street. Does everybody carry a wedding gown with them? No. So some commentators say, well, he had gowns because he's a king. And he gave the gowns to the people as they came. Because he has the means to do that. Right? And so they're all wearing gowns. But somebody refused or snuck in and said, I'm not wearing a gown. And so out they went. And I wonder, what, what does it say about the gown? I mean, we could think, well, it's just a gown. Everybody has to have on this wedding garment. Um, you can read things about the ancient Jews and what they wore and how they did things for weddings. And, you know, you read that everybody had something special to wear, even though in general they didn't wear those things, but when they went to the wedding, they had to wear it. And so what is this gown that they had to put on? You know, you could take, I mean, you can go way out of the verse and say, well, I'm supposed to put something on, right? There's something I'm supposed to wear that we'll see in a little bit for, that Paul tells us to wear. Um, is it, is it meaning that they're, they belong there? They have citizenship there? Is it their place to be? Um, and someone refuses to put that on and so where they can't be there anymore. Um, other places that we can see it in James, James chapter two, verse four talks about being judges of evil or with evil motives. So the story there is, you know, they have a, a church or a gathering and somebody comes in and they kick people out of one road. So the, the people that have the money um, that have the, the means in society get the front seat. And he says, have you made not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? To judge in that way is an evil motive because the evil, evil motive is, well, let me get in good, good with that crowd or let those people keep coming here so we can fill the coffers. Um, you know, who is never partial? God is never partial. So just like we might have a chart of how much I'm willing to listen to when I watch TV, we have charts that say, what kind of people do I want to favor over others, right? In our minds. And God doesn't have that. James goes on to say in chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, The tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. So the things that come out of the mouth can kill. They can be evil. And that's what we've seen in these few verses. In Colossians, let's turn over there to Colossians chapter 1, and we'll read verses 21 to 23. It says, And though you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So we were alienated and we were hostile. And it says we engaged in evil deeds. But if you keep reading that passage, what do you understand? I'm not past that. I can still be engaged in evil deeds. That's why he says, indeed, if you continue in faith firmly established and steadfast, you have a hope. It's not talking about losing your salvation. It's talking about who you were, who you are, who you can still be. And so Paul and Jesus spend a good amount of time explaining who we are, who we were, 
who we can be and how we should not be that. Because we're all capable of those things. Uh, that's why in Romans 12, 21, Paul says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't be overcome with evil because you can be overcome with evil. It's possible. So how do we get past this and overcome it in our lives? Well, the number one thing to me is don't believe that somehow I'm above it, right? That's arrogance. Uh, you can read in James 4, 16 to 17, he talks about that type of boastful arrogance and said that that is evil. Since we know that we can do it, we should pray and ask for help and stay rooted, as Paul is talking about in that gospel, so that we would not do it. And that's what I think we're reading in Matthew 6, 13. Keep me from it. You could also pray, if you see it the other way, don't let me be tempted by the things of the world. If you want to say by the evil one, don't let me be tempted by that um, so that I could stay away from those things. Something else, the fourth thing we could do is to think about it and turn over to Philippians chapter 4. We'll read verses 8 and 9. We read, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So we're looking at true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellence, and praise. And when I think of these things, and I think of what Paul is saying, and I think about him saying the things that you've seen me do and practice these things, and elsewhere he says, imitate me as I imitate uh, Christ or as I imitate God. He tells us to imitate God. Jesus says, imitate the Father, do what the Father does, um, because that shows the ultimate perfection and maturity. Paul says, if you do these things, the God of peace will be with you. Does that mean if I'm not doing them, the God of peace will not be with me? No. But does it mean that maybe I'll have some type of peace because I know no matter what's going on around me, that I'm dwelling and doing the things that I'm supposed to do. So all these things, true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, and excellence, and praise, to me, are all wrapped around uh, the person of Christ. They come out of the person of Christ. So that's what I dwell on. The Greek word for dwell comes from the word logos. And it means to take an inventory to think about it, to consider it, to reason it out. So I have these things in front of me and I'm taking an inventory. I'm checking them off. Is this where I am or is this not where I am? It means that you wanna constantly be aware and self-aware of what you're doing and what you're saying. And as Paul says, dwelling on those things, because when you dwell on those things, then you're doing the right thing. So when Jesus again says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Jesus is looking at those things and making sure that we stay away from those things. But dwelling on it and thinking about it can't be the end. We have to live life. And when we live life, things come at us. We go into situations and then we have the choices. That's where the dwelling and the, the list, if you want to say it, of the, of the logos, of the idea of the life of God and of Christ, those are the things we start to think about. 
And those are the different ways we can go. We can go the former way, which Paul said all of us lived, alienated, hostile, and engaging in evil. You could read Ephesians 3 and 4 and Romans 5, but 3 and 4 give you ideas of what you're supposed to do. You were one thing, now put something else on and be that instead. So you can go the old way, or you can go the new way, which you is something that you put on and are clothed in, as Paul says it. Metaphorically, I'm taking something and I'm draping it over my body, right? And that's where I thought, wow, kind of like wedding attire. If I'm in God's kingdom, walking in his kingdom, he has certain ways that you're supposed to walk in his kingdom. He offers me something. Put this on. If you put this on and you stay within it, then it's going to go great. It's going to go great between you and me in the way that you're supposed to be living. It's not, it's not indicating to us that things in physical life will go great. It doesn't mean that, oh, I'm going to have the best job that I've always wanted. I'm going to have the best car. I'm going to have a beautiful house. I'm going to have money. It's going to be successful. And nothing bad is ever going to happen to me. Right? You think about that. If that was the case, then you wouldn't need this. Because all that would be there. So why would I need to have to worry about good and evil? Because you would think I'd already be there. But these are the ways we go. Another way to look at, look at it. Um, and, you know, of course, I always look things up, and I am told that by some people this is the wrong way to think about this passage, but Matthew 7, 13 to 14, you have a choice. You have a narrow gate, and you have a wide gate, right? Uh, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it? So, what do we choose? James says in 125, be doers, not just hearers. We hear, right? But we don't do. I think I said that last week or the week before that I, I read in a book where they had different phases that Christians go through, right? They, they hear, they know. They read. They go to church, they hear, and they know. But once they're out living, the knowing stays. And it doesn't actually come out. It stays there. So they know one thing, but they do another. Uh, Richard Rohr says, We do not think ourselves into new ways of living. We live ourselves into new ways of thinking. And that's true. We do learn things, and we put them into practice. But when we put them into practice and we do, it begins to change our thinking because we actually see the things happening. And the more that we live ourselves with these things, the more things happen and the more experience happens. As long as we dwell, right? As long as we're wearing what we're supposed to wear, then these things that we see around us change our thinking more and more and more towards the ways of God, towards the ways of his kingdom and how we're citizens of it and work and live in it and how we react to things. Kenneth Wust, who I learned today and I did not know this, he is one of the translators on the NASB, uh, NASB commi committee. I thought he just did his own thing, but apparently uh, he did do his own thing after uh, he did that, which was kind of cool. But he uses the word often, like Jonathan Mitchell uses, experiential. In John 8, 31, according to Mr. Wu's Bible, he says, then Jesus was saying to the Jews, Having believed him, we're at the moment maintaining that attitude of faith. As for you, if you remain in the word, which is mine, truly my disciples you are. And you shall know the truth in an experiential way, and the truth shall make you free. 
So how is the truth going to make you free? According to what he just said, it's only going to make you free if you experience. You live. You dwell. You wear. And you go out and you experience life through those things. And it changes the way you think. And it changes the way you act. It changes the things you say and how you view things. It, it should, hopefully, take the lists that we make and start crossing things off and the list gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Because there's one thing, there's one way, and that is Jesus Christ. And so we experience that. Uh, you know, I just looked up the word experiential through uh, Kenneth Hughes Bible, and um, one place uh, that he uses it often, but one of the places he uses it is when Jesus is talking to Philip, and Philip asks him, show us the Father. And Jesus says, how can you be with me and ask? Show us the Father. In Mr. Woos, he says it as, how can you have been experiencing me? You have experiential knowledge of me because you've been with me. You've been seeing it. You've been partaking. You've been doing these things. You already know who the Father is. Not just head knowledge, but because you've actually been doing it. Because you've been witnessing it. You've experienced it. He goes, uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians 18 to 25, as written by Mr. Woost, he starts off for, for the story. That story concerning the cross is, on the one hand, to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us, on the other hand, who are being saved, it is God's power. And he continues on. When he's talking about wise people, he says, where is a philosopher skilled in letters? cultivated, learned. Now, I love this next one that he had. Where is a man learned from, learned in sacred scriptures? Right? There's a lot of people that are very learned in the scriptures. But he's, Mr. Woos is saying that in itself isn't necessarily going to do anything for you. Right? There are certain things that will do something for you. So that's, he lumps those in with Wiseman, he says, where is a learned sophist of this age? A sophist is a really wise person. If you look the word up, uh, the Greek, where it comes from, the Greeks used to use it. They had people they called sophists. They knew math. I mean, they knew all kinds of stuff. They were super wise people. Where are they? He says, he calls them foolishous reasoners <laughs> that they are. Did not God prove the foolish, prove foolish the wisdom of this world system? For in view of the fact that in the wisdom of God, the world system through its wisdom did not come to have an experiential knowledge of God. So all the wisdom, all the knowledge that they've collected, everything that they know, this is right, this is wrong. This is the way you talk, this is the way you don't talk. This is the way you treat people, this is not the way you treat people. And everything they knew, it meant nothing without going out and experiencing it and experiencing what is right and doing what is right regardless. So I think that's why Jesus says, pray this way. And I think what Mr. Peterson says is perfect. Deliver us from ourselves. Why? Because something is there that can cause me to live outside of what is intended for me to live. And so you might say, well, what are you saying? Is it wrong for me to pray to be free of something that God sees me as free from already? Right? The cross and what the cross did. Does this seem like contradictory Thinking? I don't think so. Because it's not about works-based salvation. It's about works-based life. It doesn't mean, I don't live this way, I'm not going to heaven. I live this way, I'm going to heaven. It means, 
Well, let's say it this way. I'm going to heaven, so this is how I live. Right? If you want to look at it that way. Because that's how a lot of Christians would look at it. It's about living your citizenship and who you are. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And some people might say, well, to use this verse in this context is out of context. Because the context is talking about you're saved by grace, not by works. So why then do many, and as I am right now, use this verse as I'm his workmanship, created to do good works. God prepared these works a long time ago that I'm supposed to work them, right? It doesn't put me in good graces with God that so someday he'll accept me. It's not for eternal salvation, if you want to use it in that phrase, but it's for this life experience. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, we read, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work within you, work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is at work in me today, always. So what is it that I'm praying for? I'm praying, or I should be praying, God, help me make the right choice. Help me follow the way that you intended me to follow. Like we just read a few minutes ago. Uh, actually, I don't think we read it. I think we read it from a different Corinthians. But in first Corinthians, we read it from 1 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 15, Paul talks about being saved. We're being saved. That doesn't mean that you're saved or not saved. It means that you're being guided in a way right now in this life that follows your salvation, your hope, your gospel, God's gospel that you've been saved in. And how is it that you're showing that? Because we are here for a reason. And so we need help so that we maintain being here for that reason. And it has to be something that we live that's experienced so that others can experience it through us and with us. And so I think that this prayer is, that's what this prayer is about. It's about help me live the life that I am called to live. Help me do the works that God prepared and has placed inside me already. Help me do this. Help me. If you take the, the Lord's Prayer in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, you can see all through it where Jesus is saying, this is how we live if you are a follower of me. And so when you are praying, ask, help me. Live that way. Keep my mind set the way where it's supposed to be. Help me dwell and help me get that dwelling out. Because God wants to reach others. And he reaches those others, not only through himself, because he calls all, it's his work, but he uses us to do that. And if we are not in the right place in our walk and doing what we're supposed to be doing each moment of the day, then we're not doing what we were prepared to do. Amen. Amen.